Okay, so any questions? Yeah. Biometrics. Okay, the last thing here was the something you have form of authentication. So something in your possession. So can you think of a real world example of a <coughs> something you have? Key, a car key. Yeah, that's a good example. Anything else? I know that for, for PayPal, sometimes you can like order this thing, like you press a button on it and so it's a number to enter when you sign in. Oh, okay. Paper. Yeah, there's things like that. Okay, sort of like a one time password or something. It generates a password. Okay. Okay. Credit card, you could consider a credit card. You actually have to physically have the credit card in your possession, right? Anything else? Smart card. Smart card, similar to that, yeah, smart card. How about ATM card? Okay, there's something you have to have as well. So those are all uh, good examples. Okay, we're gonna look at something a little bit different, uh, a password generator. So it's kind of similar to the device that you would have to uh, enter a password. So the idea here is that Alice is traveling you know, on business. She wants to get uh, access to the company's uh, computing system. So Bob is the server that she has to get access to, uh, to, to get access to the computer. So she carries with her this uh, password generator. So think of it as like a little pocket calculator kind of thing, and she can punch numbers into it, all right? Bob, and it has stored in it some key K, which Bob, the server, also knows. Okay, so here's the protocol. Alice is gonna say, hey, I'm Alice, and Bob, the server, is gonna say? It's gonna say what? <laughs> not quite, okay, that's the idea, but not quite so straightforward. He's gonna say, prove it, right? And the way you prove it is he's gonna send a random number, a random challenge to Alice. And the challenge for Alice is, to type this number into her password generator, okay? And it's gonna tell her what to send back, all right? So in order to do that, she has to enter her PIN number along with the random PIN number just to open the thing up and then enter the random number into this password generator. The password generator is gonna use the key that it knows along with that random number to and hash those two guys together to produce a number, because there's another number. Now Alice is gonna send that back to Bob and what's Bob gonna do? Well, he knows K, he knows R, he can hash those two, and he will check to see if he gets the same value. What does it tell him if he gets the same value? T tells him whoever sent this must know the key K. Who knows the key K? Only somebody who has this password generated. The only person who has that is Alice, okay? The only one who can type the pins on. So it must be Alice, okay? So that's what's supposed to convince him here. So we can call this uh, R here a challenge. It's a challenge sent from Bob. You know, prove that you're really Alice, who you claim to be. Uh, Alice enters the pin, and she uh, enters the uh, R into the password generator, and then it hashes those two to produce the uh, correct value that she can send back to Bob. And import an important point here, is that Bob knows enough that he can verify the response, right? He knows that. How about Trudy? Can Trudy pretend to be Alice here? Can't she manage the uh, She can't enter, she doesn't have the password generator, so she can't do this. Now, Trudy could be sitting here, that's a good point. She could be sitting here, Trudy could be a server, right? Or uh, a router, right? Sending stuff back and forth. Trudy could see all this stuff go back and forth. So, really, all Bob knows when this is done is that. Alice contacted him, and Alice is out there, and it's happening right now. This is live, it's happening now. So we still have to do a little bit of work to make sure this is secure, but at least we got the authentication part done. We know it's Alice. Okay, note here that um, Alice not only has to have the password generated, but she has to know the pin. Okay, so that's really two things, right? Something you have and something you know. Uh, we can't just call that something you have and something you know. We have to give it a fancy name, so we'll call it two-factor authentication. Okay, so any two of the three, uh, something you know, something you have, and something you are, any two of the three. So you could have a biometric where you have to use your thumbprint and you enter a password. Something you know, something you are. Could have, you know, something you have and something you know, you know, whatever. Any combination you want. Yeah? One question. 
So in the scenario he gave where he was having to do his uh, handprints mm -hmm. and he was checking his weight, does that count as two-factor authentication? I guess not technically according to this definition. Those would both be biometrics, but uh, you know, it's one and a half factors. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so any two of these three. Okay, so can you think of other examples other than that pokey password generator thing? ATM card. ATM card's a good one, right? You have the ATM card, you have to know the PIN. What else? Smart cards. Smart card, yeah, you have a PIN or something or a password to unlock that. It's on with the uh, card. How about the credit card? You have a credit card and a signature. Really pathetic biometric, but you know, it's. It's two, two things. Okay. Uh, okay, so just a couple, uh, one more kind of, a couple more odds and ends here at the end of this chapter that I want to mention. Um, the idea of single sign on. Okay, so you have so many passwords. Every website you go to wants a password. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to get a different password for every website, or are you going to just use the same password? Whatever you do, it's not good. Okay? So maybe a better approach would be if you could just go to the first site you go to, you log in, you have to authenticate, you have to enter a password. But from that point on, you're sort of automatically authenticated wherever you go. So it's just one time that you need to authenticate, and it happens behind the scenes from then on. Okay, people have actually thought, well, we'll actually see an example of this when we talk about protocols. Uh, Kerberos is considered a single sign-on protocol. It's not, you know, an internet-wide thing. It's typically used on a local network. But on your LAN, you authenticate just like you ordinarily do, type in your password. And then everything you do, you know, every resource you access, everything you do is authenticated, but it all happens behind the scenes. Okay? So that's nice. It's convenient. Now, for the internet, people have actually thought about this. How could you do this for the on an internet-wide scale? And people have come up with sort of plausible architectures for how you do it. And like most things in computing, there's two approaches here. One is the Microsoft way, and one is the everybody else way. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what the status of this is, because uh, I saw this, you know, this was going on four or five years ago, and I don't think it's ever really panned out. But, at the time, I saw, I saw a talk by these guys from Liberty Alliance on this, and they really didn't like these guys, and it's clear those guys didn't like them. And, uh, you know, they said Liberty here, Liberty Alliance means Liberty from Microsoft. <laughs> you, get, you get the idea. I believe Facebook's doing that now. You sign into Facebook and you know your credentials and apply to other websites. Oh, yeah. And there's yeah. other websites like Twitter and Google and all that, like, you have. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, so it would certainly be convenient. Okay, another uh, authentication-related thing I wanted to mention is uh, web cookies. Okay, so what's the purpose of a web cookie? What is it? It's state. It's really an issue of state. Okay, so the idea is this. So I go to uh, Amazon.com, right? They will send a cookie. They will just generate this number. It's just a number. It's not chocolate chip or anything. It's just a number. They send it to me. Okay, I get this cookie. My web browser takes care of it. I don't even see it. I don't have to worry about it. Right? All happens behind the scenes. They keep track of that number. Now, every time I send stuff back and forth, that number is attached. So they know this is part of, this is something I did. So they can keep a database on their end, and they can keep track of what I do. So now I come back you know, uh, two weeks later, and I log in, and the cookie is sent by my browser because I'm going back to Amazon, and that's Amazon's cookie. So it sends it back. They look up in their database, and they say, oh, this is Mark Stamp. He loves books on security. So as soon as I log in, it says, hi, Mark Stamp. Here's the latest security books. You know, that's how they know that stuff. Right? Uh, okay, so it's a way to maintain state. What does it mean, state? Well, protocols sort of come in two flavors, stateless and stateful. What's a stateless protocol? <laughs> been kind of circular here. Right? So, okay, so stateless means it doesn't remember anything. Okay, it doesn't remember what goes on. Stateful would have some sort of memory. HTTP, the protocol you use in web browsing, is stateless. Even within a transaction, it's stateless. So it's a way to add state. Now, so it, it's not intended for any security purposes. Okay, there's not supposed to be any security feature here. But think about it. You design this website, and somebody shows up, and they have this cookie, right? Well, you know, 
it's Mark Stamp. He's got the cookie, right? So let's, you know, say, hey, if you're Mark Stamp, you know, here's some stuff you would like. And I always love this part. There's a little box down there at the bottom that says, and by the way, if you're not Mark Stamp, please click here. <laughs> yeah, I'm Trudy. I'll click here. Um, so it's kind of tempting. The point here is it's kind of tempting to use it as a very weak form of authentication because it doesn't bother the user. It's there, you know, should be that person. Probably most of the time it is. Why not use it as authentication? Well, it's probably not a very good idea to use it. But it's tempting to use it in that uh, way. Uh, you know, of course, at Amazon, if I really wanted to do something important, they would make me enter a password or do something more. But you know, still, it's kind of tempting to use it that way. Uh, 